Using centralized cryptocurrency exchanges is a really polarizing topic. The reality is the vast majority of people rely upon cryptocurrency exchanges to either buy a crypto, you know, cash some crypto out to fiat, or even store large amounts or even all of their own cryptocurrency. You know, sometimes they're life savings. Well, regardless of where you fall in this equation, there's always huge risks to your funds anytime you're using a cryptocurrency exchange like this if you don't take the proper precautions to protect yourself. But in this video, I want to talk about how to do that and how to minimize the risk that something bad will happen happen to you. Because if crypto is a rocket going to the moon, then the last thing that I personally want to do is lose my ticket to that rocket ship before it takes off. So I'm going to talk about that in this video today as a blockchain developer who works the technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step -step start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. So one of the reasons that I'm making this video is that I keep seeing news stories online of people who are losing just ridiculous amounts of cryptocurrency because they just didn't take basic precautions to secure their funds. I see this a lot with people, you know, losing funds inside their MetaMask because they weren't using a hardware wallet or people losing funds off a centralized cryptocurrency exchange. And this news story just popped up about Coinbase reporting at least 6,000 user accounts compromised through ex exploit. Uh, in their authentication system. So this is something that actually happened earlier this year, but we're just now getting news about it. So Coinbase had a, a exploit in the multi-factor authentication process for the exchange that affected 6,000 customers. The attacker obtained account information, then used this flaw in Coinbase's multi-factor authentication system to access the user's accounts and actually move the funds off their exchange. So thankfully, you know, Coinbase sent a message out to their customers and actually patched this up and reimbursed everyone who was affected by this because this was a bug on their end. But what happens to you if you just don't take the proper precautions to secure your own account? Can you guarantee that you'll actually get reimbursed reimbursed because you didn't, you know, implement proper security measures to your own account. Well, let's talk about some basic steps that you can take to reduce the likelihood that that's going to happen. So let's first start off by talking about the inherent problem of keeping your funds on a cryptocurrency exchange like this, a centralized cryptocurrency exchange. Because as the old adage goes, you know, I guess not that old, but in terms of crypto, it is, you know, not your keys, not your coins, or not your keys, not your crypto. Basically, if somebody's holding on to it, then you don't own it. Now, like I said, for the vast majority of people, they need to use an exchange somehow. And for some people, you know, the amount of money they keep in exchange is okay for them to store some funds on there. And even if not, there's a certain, you know, profile of people that are just more comfortable letting somebody else take care of their crypto because they don't trust themselves to self-custody because there's always extra steps you have to take when doing that. So if you fall into either of those two camps, then how can you, you know, help protect yourself? So let's talk about the problem and then some solutions to this. So first of all, realize that if your funds are sitting on a cryptocurrency exchange, the only thing that's standing in between an attacker and your money is really just your password. Okay. So basically, if somebody gets access to your password, then they can access your cryptocurrency in many cases. So rule number one with online online security is never reuse passwords across multiple websites, okay? Now, I realize that a lot of people are going to fail to even follow this basic step in the first place because it requires a lot of work. You have to use a password manager, you typically speaking, to manage passwords across every single internet site. The whole idea is basically if someone finds out your password on one website, they can just access any account they want to. So my first recommendation is to do that, but let's say you don't even do that. In the very least, use a different password for your cryptocurrency exchange than you would any, you know, password. If you're going to make one password unique on anything, at least make it your crypto account and make it a strong password. Okay. So, but anyways, let's say that you have, you know, set up a unique password for every single website or in the very least that you've done that first step of making your crypto password unique. You need to still make the problem harder because at the end of the day, let's say someone gets access to that password. If they have it, then they can access your crypto funds. So you make this harder by making the attacker require a second piece of information or a second authentication method. So the key word is authentication. So you need to understand that. Basically, that just means that that's how a website proves that you are you. It authenticates that you are the user that has access to this account. That's where multi-factor authentication comes into play. So if you're using a password and that's it, that's single factor authentication. And if, if an attacker has access to that one factor, then they can access your funds. Now, you make this problem harder by requiring the attacker to have a second factor. So let's talk about some different you know, strategies for doing that. One of those common ones is SMS authentication. I'm talking about why you should not use this, okay? And in some cases, it can be worse than single factor authentication. Uh, using an authenticator app like Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, there's others, okay? And then also the last one, major one is a hardware authentication. So let's start off with SMS authentication and... Uh, why this is probably one of the most common ones, but why it's bad, bad, bad. And I don't even recommend using it because in some cases it can be worse than uh, just not having a second factor at all. 
So basically, here's why. It was something called SIM swapping. This is when someone actually gets access to the SIM card of your cell phone. And when they access that, then they can basically, that's all that they need to, to get access to your cryptocurrency account. So how does this typically work? Well, this is when somebody calls your cell phone carrier. Let's say you use Verizon in the United States or there's lots of SIM care. You know, there's lots of cell phone providers around the world. This problem gets worse actually as you, you know, depending on your, your cell phone carrier. But basically they pretend to be you and they get access to your SIM card and have it sent to, you know, address, they pick it up and then they just pop it into a phone and then they have access to your your phone number. So they can do this in multiple ways. Um, They can essentially do it through identity theft and they can reconstruct your identity and get it sent to them. Sometimes all it takes is a phone call to a kind of an incompetent phone support person, especially if they act like super distressed on the phone. Um, They can sort of just push the process along that might circumvent the normal procedures and just they'll just do it to make the customer happy and they're not super competent and they can get a SIM card and then and then basically do a reset password link and then the, all they need is your cell phone and they've accessed your cryptocurrency exchange. They can change the email address on you, all that type of stuff. So And that's why you should basically just never use SMS authentication. And that's basically why you should just never use SMS authentication. In many cases, people started offering SMS authentication as just a way to collect more data about you in the first place. So let's talk about some better alternatives. So another alternative is an authenticator app. So what is this? Well, one really popular example is the Google Authenticator or the Microsoft Authenticator. And if you don't want to use one created by big tech, you don't have to. They all work about the same. You could just find a more independent app developer who creates uh, something that that generates a one-time password based on the hash that the app gives you. So I'll explain what that means. So basically, uh, whenever you enable this method of two-factor authentication, each individual website that you visit that you want to turn two-factor authentication on, let's say you have a Binance account and you want to turn on two-factor authentication, then Binance will give you a unique hash, okay? Um, And then basically, you can store that hash on your separate device And then every 30 seconds, minute, whatever the interval is, it'll generate a new one-time password. It usually looks like a string of like maybe six, uh, maybe eight uh, uh, numbers and like one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you'll just type that in after it requests your second factor and that'll keep cycling. So like... Uh, it's, no, you have to know exactly what it is at that point in time to gain access. In many cases, they make this very streamlined process where you can just scan a QR code on your phone and it'll onboard this and then you can basically have your password and then someone also needs this. Now, let's talk about some of the trade-offs for this because the problem with this is you have to now back up that hash that the app gives you somewhere else and if you lose it, like you're going to lose access to your account if you have two-factor authentication turned on because you need your email address, you need your password, and then you need this hash to generate that one-time password over and over again. You have to back this hash up and put it somewhere. Uh, and anytime you back something up in, that's like not digital or like not on your primary device, you typically need a second backup off-site because you definitely don't want to store these inside your password manager because that's the whole idea. If your password manager gets compromised, then they have access to your password and then also your two-factor authentication uh, codes they have the keys to the kingdom, essentially. And if you're going to use a second factor like this, my recommendation is always store the Authenticator app on a separate device than from whatever computer you're using to access your primary account. So you could, you know, in the case of like crypto, for example, you could say, uh, I'm only going to access my cryptocurrency exchange on my Binance account, like let's use that as an example, like on a computer. And then you have a phone that does the second factor authentication. The whole idea here is somebody steals your computer and then let's say, you know, they were somehow able to access your crypto exchange that way. If they don't have your phone, then they don't have access to that, you know, second factor. And then, you know, that 2FA on your phone, let's say they do steal it, you want to be able to have some sort of password protection on that 2FA code. Typically don't recommend having biometrics for that because then someone could just whack you on the head and then like put your, you know, fingerprint or your face up to your computer and your phone and then just get access to everything. All right, so the last option for multi-factor authentication uh, is a hardware key. So this is essentially like a dongle that you can just plug into your computer And instead of having like some sort of authenticator app where you have to like back up the seed and it rotates, you know, a one-time password every so often, all you need is a second piece of hardware uh, after you enter your password in and you can like tap the hardware to, you know, prove that you're here. It can unlock the account. So one really popular example of this is like the YubiKey, okay? So you can buy YubiKeys in all different uh, shapes and sizes. You can buy them uh, with like an iPhone adapter here with USB-C, you know, regular USB. There's all kinds of different interfaces, even ones that have like 
the whatever that proximity technology is called, where you can just like tap it on your phone like they use with the Apple Pay. There's all kinds of different ones. So there are some trade-offs to this approach too. One really nice thing is you actually have to have the physical hardware present in order to do the authentication, okay? So let's say someone somehow compromised you know, both your hash and your password, right? So they just need data to do this. The second thing here is that they actually need a piece of hardware, a physical device to actually access your account. Now that does come with some trade-offs, like I was saying. So basically, if you lose that individual device itself, well, then you've lost access to your account. But there's some ways to mitigate this risk. So basically, um, you can add multiple keys to an account. So you could add a backup key and you could store that backup key somewhere else right? So in case you lose it, then you have your backup. And I know that sounds like a pain, but if you're using multi-factor authentication and you end up writing your, uh, you know, your backup codes that on paper, or something like that, you have to store those anyway. And so you might consider, you know, having a hardware key like this, because at the end of the day, you're usually storing something physical somewhere anyway. And if you end up doing stuff on mobile, like I said, they have mobile support as well, in addition to, you know, desktop and laptop support. All right, so that's an overview of the different multi-factor authentication schemes for securing your account, particularly for your cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, centralized cryptocurrency exchange services. So again, like I said, I'm a realist. I realize that a lot of people are going to use cryptocurrency exchanges to store funds. Sometimes it's a good you know, move for them to do that in the first place. Some people, it's not necessarily such a good move. I'm a realist to know that people are going to do it. And so if you are going to do it, then I highly recommend taking some of these steps to secure your account. You know, at the very least, do not use the same password as you use somewhere else. Make sure that password is backed up in a really good place. Make sure it's a strong password. And I highly recommend adding a second factor to authenticate authenticate your account and basically try to stay as far away from SMS authentication as you possibly can. And by taking these steps, you're really going to drastically reduce the likelihood that someone could access your funds. So hope you like this video. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you go to my YouTube homepage, you find my free courses there. They like you to be courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step by step from start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.